Um, so, I really wanted to welcome uh, the folks from the Wards Co. Packing Legal Team. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be here with us today. Um, we really appreciate uh, you sharing the stories that you have about the Wards Co. Packing trial. Uh, we heard some stories earlier about how uh, Connie Montoya uh, followed New York, uh, along with Danny Chen, uh, they created the uh, Wards Co. Packing mock trial, or the trial reenactment. And a lot of our affiliates are now doing the trial reenactment. So this is a trial that we sort of hold near and dear to our heart. Um, but we did want to just quickly introduce you to our organization. Um, the National Filipino American Lawyers Association is the national voice for the Filipino American legal community. Um, we've been around for about five and a half years. We started off with about three or four affiliates and we are now 13 affiliates strong with a national footprint of 10 states. Uh, we're over a thousand members nationwide and I uh, just wanted to show you sort of our mission statement. This is our brand new mission statement um, and wanted to focus on the second point. We are advocates for justice, civil rights, and equal opportunity for the Filipino American community. So we are community advocates, but we ask you to be here today because we want to learn from you how to be effective community advocates because we we're, we, you guys have been there and done that, and you're the experts at it. So we hope to learn from you today um, how to be effective community advocates. And I know John's got some introductory uh, remarks, but again, I, I do, on behalf of the Enfala board, on behalf of the 13 affiliate boards that are here today, thank you so much for being here, and thank you for sharing the story. Before we start this panel, is this, I guess it is, yeah it is that. <coughs> okay. Before we start this panel, I want to uh, talk about an example of uh, leadership and uh, an example of somebody who um, had a position a little bit more senior uh, as an attorney and really wanted to make sure that uh, she got junior attorneys involved and helped build their career. And that's what that went on, who's right here. Uh, she's senior corporate counsel at T-Mobile. She's a founding member of Flow and she's done a lot for Flow, for the Filipino community, and for me and my career. She. Uh, has been really great, so thank you, Odette. If you have a wonderful spouse. <laughs> <laughs> so through our relationship with Odette, uh, I really came to know uh, David Della, who's sitting next to me. Uh, David uh, has been a community uh, advocate um, his whole career, um, his whole life, basically. And um, he, uh, you're going to find out about his involvement uh, in the Words Co. case, uh, but you'll also note that if you read the bio, you'll see that he uh, does a lot to stay engaged in the community. And uh, when we talk about pipeline efforts and things like that, uh, David is, is also one to help uh, other leaders in the community move forward and so we can have uh, voices in, in government. So thank you for that, David. Um, there's a there's a, a bio in the, in the materials, and I, I won't get into it right now. But I will um, hand it off to David so he can uh, introduce the rest of the, of the panel. Okay, thank you, John. Hope well, this is working. Anyway, oh, well, John, thank you, and David Mesa, thank you very much for um, having us here to speak at your um, mid-year summit, right? And so um, let's start out in April as a request for me to come and do a keynote speak over lunch about uh, the Wards Cove case evolved into this. Uh, so what we did is we went to work and we gathered what we feel is an, uh, a, a panel of experts that can talk to you not only about the legal aspects of the Ward Cove case, but also the community organizing that went behind it. And as we started organizing around the panel, what came to my mind um, is, you know, there's a continuing story from Wards Cove. 
which goes into another uh, important issue and case that was that's in front of the Filipino American community, which is the Committee for Justice for Domingo and Mirnes. And so um, we kind of felt that we wanted to assemble a, um, a panel that looked at both type of cases. And, um, and uh, the panel you see here are, uh, um, is a mix of attorneys and community activists on the front line of both issues. The backdrop of the panel presentations you will see is uh, blatant exploitation and discrimination against Filipino workers, legal action taken, union reform, political assassination, international worker solidarity, and community organizing. So that's a bit heavy, but you'll see in the presentations how that all kind of runs together. The Warco Packing Company discrimination lawsuit and the Committee for Justice for Domingo and Verdes were significant events in our Filipino American communities because both highlight our community's historic experiences that required both the legal experience and community organizing needed to address the history of exploitation and discrimination against Filipino workers in the Alaska salmon canning industry. It recognized the history of Filipino worker militancy and union organizing. It addressed the blatant discrimination practices in the Alaska salmon canning canneries and relief through legal action and organizing. It was also that led to a launch of a reform movement against corruption in the Canada Workers Union, ILWU Local 37. The assassination of two of its reform leaders, Selmy Domingo G. Ernest, and the eventual takeover, take back of the union. And then the bigger backdrop of all this is um, the challenge of the atrocities of the brutal dictatorship of Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines. The thread connecting both these issues are the consequences of challenging some very powerful forces. From the salmon canning industry barons to union leadership to the Marcos dictatorship uh, supported by the U.S. <coughs> intelligence community. And you will hear all this in the panel presentation. And most important, the courage of leaders and the community to pursue justice. So now that I have set the tone for this panel, uh, let me now introduce the distinguished panel in the order that they're going to speak. So first uh, to my uh, left is uh, Misha Domingo, the longtime community activist here. He, he filed the original EEOC complaint in 1971 that expedited the filing of the original Title VII class action lawsuit against the major salmon, Alaska salmon canning companies. <coughs> uh, and then he's also the brother of Sammy Domingo. Uh, next to um, Nemesio is retired Judge Michael Fox. He's a retired King County Superior Court judge. He's been active uh, in the civil rights and farm workers organizing movements here and nationally. He was also on the legal team for the Title VII class action lawsuit, uh, Antonio versus Ward Co. Packing Company, and much more. And then next to uh, Judge Fox is Cindy Domingo, who's a longtime community activist and was the coordinator of the Committee for Justice for Domingo and Fairness. She's also uh, one of the authors of the book that you'll see out, out in front called The Time to Rise, which is a chronicle of stories of uh, uh, anti marcos activists and members of the Union of Democratic Filipinos, KDP. She's also the sister of Nemesio and Sammy Domingo. And then finally, we have uh, Michael Withy, who's a long, uh, long-time civil litigation attorney and social uh, justice activist. Uh, he was also on the legal team for the Committee for Justice for Domingo Vernes, uh, civil case, and also on the civil case against the Marcos, uh, Marcoses on behalf of the estates of Sammy Domingo and Jean Vernes. And he's also the author of a book that you'll see out there in front, and he'll talk about it too, called uh, Summary Execution, which talks about uh, the U.S. collusion in the, in the murders of uh, uh, Sammy Domingo and Jean Vernes. Uh, so, um, so uh, what we'll do is we'll have the panel members speak. Uh, we'll, we'll pass the microphone uh, down, and then we'll do questions and answers afterwards. And so without further ado, let's start with the mission. And I'm going to talk about the community context in which um, the, the organizing of both campaigns happened. You have to kind of step back and look at 1930s. During the 1930s, the first wave of Filipino workers were actually students, university and high school students who were 
who came to this country um, to get an education. Uh, they were called the pensionados, and that's because their families gave them money to come here to study. However, once they finished graduation, they could not find jobs in the fields that they had studied for. And so what they wound up doing was to work in the farm fields of California and in the canneries in Alaska. Uh, the intellectual outlet for these people were to publish newspapers. So when you go up and down the west coast of uh, here on the west coast, you will find every Filipino community having at least one, and in some cases two, newspapers, and this is in tradition of the pensionados. The other tradition of the pensionados was they went into labor organizing. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, Carlos Belusan, um, folks have read his two books. He was uh, a cannery organizer here in Seattle, and uh, writing books was his intellectual outlet uh, that he could not find uh, any other place. So now we shift to the summer of 1971, the 71th canning season. And what we find here is Sammy Domingo and myself, by happenstance, put into kind of a strange situation because we, we were not activists at that time. But what was happening in the cameras uh, at that time that we were at, and this was New England Fish Company, Uganic Bay facility is that young Filipino workers and uh, Asian American camera workers were actually asking for three things. Um, one was they wanted to have better housing. Um, they wanted to have the opportunity to go to the white mess halls because most of these young Filipinos and Asian Americans had Americanized uh, appetites now. And the third thing that they were talking about is why can't we get any jobs outside of just the, the normal cannery uh, jobs? In our particular cannery, um, the flashpoint was that we lived in these essentially barracks type of houses, and white crew lived in, in rooms of two uh, people in them. So, um, so the young Filipinos, including myself, took these large cardboard things that were in the warehouse, and so we built partitions between the bunk uh, the beds. And as it turned out, um, the office said this was a fire hazard and that, that we could not do this. Um, during that discussion, this was in the warehouse, um, in the middle of the, it was an informal meeting of the superintendent and some of those young folks. Um, we were talking about um, having access to the, to the uh, mess halls, to the white mess halls, and as well as, as talking about some opportunities in the cameras. And at that time, the camera had the superintendents. So we'll, we'll talk about this later. Now, the Filipino foreman had a tradition of inviting the uh, superintendent to a gathering for the end of the season. And at, at that point, these issues came up. And it turns out that, as in the past, my brother was just starting his university studies. I was just finishing mine, finishing my graduate work in mathematics. And so, in the past, whenever somebody had an issue, we would speak for them. We'd either go to the office or speak to the foreman. And so um, we kind of wind up talking about this. And uh, in each case, the superintendent said no to each of these. Now, we thought that that was at the end of it. But when we got back at the end of the season, we found out we had been terminated, my brother and I, and we had been blacklisted from, that's a term um, used in the industry being blacklisted uh, from that camera that we could not go back. Um, there was an unsuccessful meeting uh, with the union and the company, 
and it became a very heated uh, meeting. Uh, what I wound up doing is I was so pissed off that I went down to the EEOC office and filed a complaint in 71. So now, two years later, uh, we didn't go back to the cameras because we were blacklisted. So in 70, 73, my brother um, was convinced to go up to Alaska with Mike Wu, uh, who was an organizer for the United Construction Workers Association. And they went up under the guise of being oceanography students. And they went around and actually organized family workers. Um, Jean Vernis was at that time on a hunger strike because of other food at that cannery. And there were a bunch of other things going on. And at the end of the 73 canning season, we met in the office of the United Construction Workers Association at that point. We then decided we were going to form an association to address these issues of housing, uh, jobs, and uh, mess hall. So we formed the Alaska County, uh, Alaska County Workers Association in, in 73. Uh, uh, I did get a right to sue letter November of 1973, two years later, uh, in which was then used for the basis of filing uh, the, the cases in 1974. Uh, so in, in 1974, we joined with the United Construction Workers Association, which was a black, a primarily a black construction workers group who had just integrated the uh, construction industry in, uh, in King County. Before then, there were no more than a handful of construction workers that were people of color, virtually none uh, women. And we also joined the United Farm Workers of Washington State to form the Northwest Labor Employment Office. And uh, Michael Fox here was uh, the first attorney that was hired, and he will talk about his experience. So um, the cases were filed. Um, in 1974, Sam Bansag, one of the uh, plaintiffs in the Nevco case, became uh, the director for the Alaska County Workers. Uh, in 19, uh, the following year, in 75, I left my job as a, an affirmative action officer for the Department of Social and Health Services to help organize um, the Camry cases as well as ACWA. Now, one of the things that happened while these cases were being processed is the Alaska County Workers Association felt that one of the most important things that we needed to do was to get back into the union. And in 1977, um, I came up with a tactic to do this. And that was, I went down to the union office with also black witnesses and asked them if I could go back. <laughs> uh, but what happened in that case was uh, there was a lot of resistance um, to that. But after talking to them for quite a while, they said, okay, if you can find a foreman who'll take you, then we'll let you go back up, thinking that no foreman, Filipino foreman, would allow me back in the cameras. But so happened that I talked to my father that evening and asked him, uh, could you help me get back in the cameras? He said, I've got just a form and I can help you. And so uh, I think part of the agreement was that he would go up there with me to make sure I didn't cause any trouble. So the two of us went to the uh, South Nacnic cannery run by Alaska Packers Association. Now just before this patch, they did uh, try to stop me, but uh, the, one of our attorneys wrote us strong letter saying that if you do not allow me to go up there, that they would file a uh, discriminatory retaliation charge against the company, so they allowed me to come up there. Now, significance to me getting back up there is that the following year, Salvi, Jean, and those people got to go back into the canneries, and that was the start of the union reform. Um, in the remaining time, I didn't want to talk about the role of Tyree Scott 
Tyree Scott was leader of the Alaska Cannabis Association. Association. He was also the chair of the United uh, of the uh, of Lilo, the Northwest Labor Employment Office, and he talked about us needing to always be unified. And so uh, we have this multiracial um, approach. Part of that racial solidarity was in response to what was going on worldwide, and that was there was a national liberation struggle going in in many countries, including the Philippines. And it was this sense of, of being in solidarity with uh, these National Liberation Fronts that, um, that we formed these alliances. Um, and this was important uh, because part of our, our motto was no separate peace. And that was, I think, an important part of how we handled ourselves. I did want to mention one person before the closing, and this was executive director uh, at the time was Diane Arasaki. This brilliant young woman who was the director of, uh, of Lilo found this section in the 1991 Civil Rights Act that seemed uh, very uh, innocent, but what it said was, Notwithstanding any provisions of this act, nothing in this act should apply to any desperate impact case which a complaint was filed before March 1, 1975, and for which an initial decision was rendered after October 30, 1983. There was only one case in the whole country that, effect, that was in effect, and that was Ward's Cove. So the 91 Civil Rights Act excluded the very people that helped um, inspire the 91 Civil Rights Act. Oh, good afternoon, I'm Michael Fox, and uh, my lifelong fascination has been with the relationship between civil rights litigation and community organizing. And uh, a lot of the story of Ward's Cove uh, comes out of this type of history. And I'll just tell you personally, the first time I was exposed to these issues was when I was in college in upstate New York. I uh, wrote a paper on Saul Alinsky's organizing effort in Rochester, New York, where he uh, started an organization in the black community called Freedom, Integration, God, Hope, Today, or Hope, or Fight. And uh, by going up there and meeting a lot of people, I sort of got imbued with the Alinsky philosophy of how to organize. And uh, so when I got out of law school uh, and I came to Seattle, I was delighted to begin representing the United Farm Workers uh, Union over in the Yakima Valley, and then later the United Construction Workers Association, the group that, that, uh, that Demetrio referred to. And I learned a tremendous amount from Tyree Scott, who was mentioned. Tyree also was fascinated with this question about the relationship between lawyers and community organizing, when lawyers could help and when, frankly, lawyers could hurt. And I wrote a little paper about 10 years after that in 1980 that's in your materials. Uh, please give that a read. It sort of sets out the philosophy and the techniques that Tyree and I and others uh, tried to put into place back in the early 70s and certainly in connection with the United Construction Workers efforts and the ACWA efforts. Now, I would call the, this section of the presentation the Wards Cove case in labor and community organizing. And I think the central question here is, was the Wards Cove case a legal disaster or an organizing triumph? And there are certainly valid positions on both of those. Uh, I've always believed that sometimes lawyers have tunnel vision, only looking at the legal solution to problems, when civil rights lawyers certainly are in the context of a larger community struggle. And this is whether it was the uh, civil rights movement in the South in the 50s and 60s, or whether it was in Seattle in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, and some of you may know, for example, as an example of this kind of tension between lawyers and organizing, that the relationship of Thurgood Marshall and Martin Luther King was very complicated. 
Marshall was a legalist and he looked towards building the civil rights movement through a series of bricks of legal decisions. And King had a, a vision that looked upon the law as a valuable resource, but only one tool in the organizer's toolbox. And his vision was much more of local organizing efforts, building local community, and sustaining organizations in those communities to be a continuing source of pressure uh, within the community. Now, let me just give you a little background about about the Ward's Cove case and the uh, other uh, cannery litigation which we filed. Uh, when, Demisio, when I first met Demisio and his brother and some of the other folks who've been to Alaska, they told me these stories of these canneries, and it was just unbelievable. I mean, they were, you know, the white bunkhouse, the Filipino bunkhouse, the white mess hall, the Filipino mess hall, all served, serving different foods and some of it uh, arguably inferior, especially with regard to the younger uh, Filipinos who were more into hamburgers than they were into salmon uh, head soup, which some of the elders really liked. So there was a lot, of, and then some of the terms that were used, the, there's a machine that eviscerates the salmon, and the slimers, who, or that's, that's his job title, that worked along the machine, the machine was called the Iron Chink, and that was because it was the Chinese who first operated these, uh, first did the evisceration of the salmon. And so the chink comes from this derogatory name for, for Chinese people. And you know, I, I, I just listened to this and it just blew me away. And I can remember arguing the class certification motion in one of the cases before Judge Morel Sharp, a very distinguished uh, uh, federal judge here, and uh, I won't use the word because we don't use it anymore, but I can remember arguing there wouldn't be any question about certifying a class if we had a, a cotton machine down south and it was called the Iron N-word. And I remember Sharp just sort of reacting like this. And there was just blatant racism in this industry. Uh, the uh, the the, the, the biggest economic impact, of course, was what job classifications. Basically, all of the Filipinos came through Local 37 ILWU, and they were dispatched to Alaska to work in the cannery jobs. These are the dirtiest, lousiest, and lowest paying jobs there were. The white workers would be on the boats, they would be catching the fish and bringing them in, and the beach gang, which was kind of a longshore uh, type function, and they would make much, much more money than the, uh, than the Filipino workers. And they got these jobs through word of mouth and friendships, the, the white workers. Whereas the, uh, the Filipinos were all dispatched through what we later realized was a very corrupt union. Now, uh, the legal background of these cases, uh, we, our theory was premised on the legal theory of Griggs versus Duke Power which is a 1960s decision uh, authored by Chief Justice Berger uh, and joined in significantly by Judge Byron White. It was an 8-0 decision upholding the uh, disparate impact theory. And what that basically is is that if there's a policy that the employer has and it has a, it has a disparate impact on minority workers, then it's the burden of proof of the employer to show that there is a business justification for this particular policy. And the issue in, in Griggs versus Duke Power was the, was the performance on a test that was given to workers um, and the, uh, and the uh, fact that they had a high school degree. And that was much to the disadvantage of black workers in the South who all wound up in the labor departments as opposed to the higher paying uh, job classifications within Duke Power. Now that legal theory uh, reigned supreme until Ward's Cove. And um, the other uh, theory, of course, that are, that's related to this is disparate treatment. And that's where you can show an intentional act of discrimination excluding or disadvantaging minority workers from certain positions. Now, uh, Ward's Cove changed that law. And um, 
I, I commend this one uh, Law Review article to you uh, from St. John's Law Review, uh, written by Ronald Turner, when the court makes Title VII law and policy disparate impact in the journey from Griggs to Ricci. And what's written here is uh, our treatment or intentional discrimination. And that's basically what the Wards Code decision did. And um, the, um, in this article, one of the conclusions is as follows. The importation of disparate treatment methodology into disparate impact analysis relieved the employer of its Griggs-mandated burden of proving the job relatedness and business necessity of his challenge practices. And uh, the, uh, the change was certainly significant. And there were four, uh, although Griggs versus Power was 8-0, with Justice White in the majority, as I says, said, uh, joining the opinion. In Ford's Cove, it was a 5-4 decision. And the four dissenters were Justice Blackman, Justice Brennan, uh, and Thurgood Marshall. Um, and they argued that uh, the majority had, quote, upset the longstanding distribution of burdens of proof in Title VII disparate impact cases. And Blackman concludes, one wonders whether the majority still believes that race discrimination, or more accurately, race discrimination against non-whites, is a problem in our society or even remembers that it ever was, close quote. Pretty strong language for Justice uh, uh, Blackman, who was generally fairly mild in his opinions. Now, what happened after uh, the, uh, the Ward's Cove decision, which was decided in 1989? As, as Nemesio alluded to, in 1991, Congress responded to Ward's Cove by passing the Civil Rights Act of 1991. And what that that section of the act did was to reinstitute with a statutory provision the disparate impact theory that had been set out in Griggs. And as uh, Nemesio mentioned, there's only one case that wasn't applicable to, and that was, lo and behold, Ward's Cove. And the, the act was uh, amended, the Title VII was amended as follows to include this language. An unlawful employment practice based on disparate impact is established when a complaining party demonstrates that a respondent uses a particular employment practice that causes a disparate impact on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin, and the respondent, the defendant, fails to demonstrate that the challenge practice is job-related for the position in question and consistent with business necessity. So the Wards Cove case did result in a major change in the statutory civil rights laws of the United States. And as I think you'll hear from Mike and Cindy, the whole organizing effort around these three cannery cases led to the uh, reform of Local 37, with the tragedy of the murders of Sylvie and Jean uh, taking place after new leadership had been elected to lead Local 37. Uh, the, uh, the local 37 leadership prior to that time had been corrupt, had been not, the union had not been operated for the benefit of the workers, but rather for the, uh, for the benefit of the uh, union leadership. Uh, the organizing effort must be viewed, in my opinion, as a total success. A corrupt regime was replaced permanently with a progressive leadership, which has uh, placed the welfare of the workers above all else. Thank you very much. Cindy? So thank, thank you very much for um, bringing this panel and seeing that the work that we've done uh, historically and are currently doing around Sami and Jean's case are very important to Filipinos and to the, the legal profession. Um, you know, I, uh, what I'm going to do is give you a little bit more background about the murders and some of the organizing that we did, and then Mike Withy is going to kind of give you a sense of what our current work around Salmi and Jean's case and the U.S. intelligence involvement and the government, uh, our strategies now. Um, last June, 
First, we commemorated the 37th anniversary of Sammy and Jean's assassination. We call it an assassination because it was a paid hit by the Marcos, uh, by the Marcoses. And even after three murder trials and winning a landmark federal lawsuit of $25 million, this struggle is far from over. And at the very beginning, after Salmi and Jean died, we said we would never rest until full justice was gotten in this case. But little did we know that it would take us to, to today to continue that work. I'm in complete agreement with Michael Fox's uh, statement about how uh, our legal work is only one of the tools in the toolbox. And I think it's important that Filipinos, especially in this country as well as in the Philippines, understand the important organizing and legal work that we have done in this country. If you go to a bookstore, you'll see very little written about Filipino American history. And yet these two cases show the intersection between our legal work, our organizing work, our media strategies, our, and our lobbying strategies, and what it takes to build um, a progressive community in the United States, and to build that international solidarity with our struggles here in the, Fili in the United States with the Philippines. Our struggle for justice remains very alive today, and especially because the underlying issues in which Salmi and Jean gave their lives remain with us with even more urgency than it did back in the 1980s. Given the human rights situation in the Philippines, given the dismantling of the democratic institutions that were placed, set in place after the 1986 People's Power Revolution, given the struggles in which we are conducting in this country to save our democratic rights and to protect the human rights that people are facing as exhibited by what's happening in terms of immigration rights in this country. At the time of uh, Salmi and Jean's deaths, and as uh, David said, they were co-founders of Lilo as well. Jean Varnas was one of the plaintiffs in the Wards Cove case. Salmi was in the New England Fish Company case. So at the time of their deaths, they were only 29 years old, really just the beginning, beginning of their lives, but, had, but were very well established um, activists in their own right through the cannery lawsuits as community activists, saving the international district as a neighborhood, student leader, uh, Salmi was a student leader at the University of Washington through the Filipino American Student Association, and again, as labor leaders, both in the Alaska Canyon Workers Club as well as the International Longshoremen Warehousemen's Union internationally. But what brought them onto the international stage were, was their membership in an organization called the KDP, the Union of Democratic Filipinos. The only radical Filipino-American organization in the United States at that time with 10 chapters, with a socialist program, and open support for the Philippine Revolution, National Democratic Revolution in the Philippines. And at that time, as we've said, the Philippines was under the dictatorship of Milda and Ferdinand Marcos since 1972. And so the KDP was a leader in the US-based opposition uh, organized to end US support for the Marcos regime. And the U.S. was the lifeline of, of the dictatorship. Salmi and Jean uh, utilized their Filipino community presence, their organizing, and their labor positioning in the ILWU to advance the goals of the KDP and to try to get the, the U.S. labor movement to oppose the dictatorship and to economically impact uh, the support uh, that the U.S. was giving to the Marcos regime. If you know anything about the ILWU, they can stop the loading and unloading of cargo, so they can have an economic impact, and, are, and is probably still the most progressive labor union in the country. Prior to uh, Salman Jean, who presented a resolution after Jean came home, and uh, Jean went to the Philippines in May of 81, 
and, and met Salmi at, at the uh, International Convention of the ILWU and presented a resolution to send an investigating team of the ILWU to the Philippines to investigate labor conditions of uh, the trade union movement in the Philippines. Previous to that, the only organi labor organization that had taken a position um, around the Philippines was actually Cesar Chavez of the United Farm Workers. And unfortunately, Cesar Chavez came back in support of the dictatorship, which led to leading members of the UFW, the Filipino members, Philip Veracruz and others, to leave the United Farm Workers over that split. And so the uh, potential of the ILWU sending an investigating team and then to come back eventually then to condemn the dictatorship was a great danger for the dictatorship. And so before that investigating team was even sent, Salmi and Jean were murdered. That resolution put into play the, um, the plan for their assassination and to stop that work before it even uh, began, really began to move forward. The facts um, were that two men on June 1st went into the Union, killed Gene Varnas immediately with a bullet through his heart, and Salmi was shot five times, but was able to make it outside of the Union and give a dying declaration, naming the two hitmen. That then unfolded the murder conspiracy and within a matter of a couple weeks, the people who had worked closest with Salma and Jean, members of the KDP, determined who were those people, who were, who were the enemies that ordered Salma and Jean's killing, who could have benefited from those murders. The Marcos regime, the cannery companies, and the U.S. government because of the work that the KDP and, um, was doing in relationship to building an international solidarity. And so that was the beginning of trying to figure out who was responsible for Salmi and Jean's murder and who was at the center, the intersection between those three entities was the president of the union, Tony Baruso, who eventually was tried for the murders of Salmi and Jean, found guilty, and sent to prison for life um, seven years, the eight years after the murders. Um, the murders were meant to look like a dispute over union reform. They happened in broad daylight at the height of traffic hour, but yet we knew that there was more to it. Three weeks later, after Salmi and Jean were killed, on June 21st, the Committee for Justice for Domingo and Vernus was formed with a public meeting in the Union Hall where Salmi and Jean were killed. The goals of that were to break the intimidation that the murders were supposed to uh, grab hold of the community with, to protect those in the Union that had gone in the next day to conduct dispatch and to ensure that Union reform didn't stop. An appeal to the community was made for any information and for any witnesses to come forward. And with that, a call for justice was put out, signed by labor leaders, by elected officials, community leaders from various communities. And that set the tone for the uh, pursuit for justice in Salmi and Jean's case. The Committee for Justice, at its height, contained 100 active members of various communities, eight outreach co uh, committees, mobilizations to the trials, even eight years later when we tried our federal lawsuit. The, the, uh, it was important to show that Salmi and Jean were not, were not to be forgotten and the pursuit for justice was going to continue until we got justice. We issued weekly newsletters. This was before the time of computers, so <laughs> the difficulty of doing that, writing, mobilization to the trials, raising money for independent investigations, and the work that the committee was doing, uh, because many of us quit our professions in order to pursue justice, and to create a um, community base in which we could pressure 
both the federal level and the local level in the pursuit of witnesses as well as to get the prosecutor to try uh, those that were involved in the murder. Uh, Mike will cover you know, some of the work we did in terms of the FBI involvement there. It was important also to always realize what, um, what was the political atmosphere that we were organized under. Uh, after the first year of our work, we realized that we were coming to um, a head in terms of what we could accomplish and that the barriers that were being thrown up against us. And in, fortunately, in 1982, Ferdinand Marcos decided to come and make one of his first state visit. And that is the time we filed our civil suit and served, him, uh, served them with papers. We made the claims with other uh, high-level cases, the, um, the assassination of Orlando, uh, Orlando Latelier in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, the case of Karen Silkwood and the involvement of uh, the U.S. in that, in that um, case, and the use of national security as a way for governments and government officials to um, get away with uh, without any accountability for the crimes that uh, our government is conducting, and in um, and so we use that high-level visit to publicize our case. And in 1983, when uh, Benigno Aquino was so brazenly killed uh, in Manila, we also tied our efforts to that assassination and wrote on the flow. That, that the world was uh, focusing on the Philippines. Lastly, um, you know, the 1986 Philippine Revolution and seeing that now, given Cory Aquino um, was in power, approaching that government for help in the pursuit as our, and we were named one of three top human rights cases that the Aquino government was going to help with. So without the Committee for Justice for Domingo Veritas, um, this case would never continue to have the high level of uh, public support, especially in the Philippines, as well as here nationally in communities. But obviously we need to continue to write about it, and that's one of the reasons we wrote A Time to Rise. Uh, there's a section there about our organizing uh, for the Committee for Justice and the Murders of Salmi and Jean, and our hope to institutionalize the lessons learned from that work. Thanks. Selma Domingo with four bullet holes in him, seeing his best friend Gene Varen bleed out on the union floor, got outside, hailed down the fire, and said those two words that began to unravel this murder conspiracy, those two words were Ramil and Galois, the hitmen paid by the Marcus regime. Because what Selma said to himself is this cannot stand. There must be justice in this my friends will pick up this country. That was his last quest, his last wish, and he must continue to answer it. And the other thing the murder conspiracy didn't depend upon, didn't count on, was the incredible courage of people like Cindy Domingo, Amicio Domingo, Dave Della, Barbara Vanness, to fight for years and years in order to accomplish justice a $25 million verdict, both in federal court by a judge as well as a jury, finding the Marcus regime liable for those murders. Uh, no, that's not it. 
Page 12 of my book. Across the street from the Union Hall, this is after Selmy named Vermeil and Little Way. A middle-aged man in a dark leather jacket with a concealed firearm emerged from a telephone booth, looked at the scene in front of the Union, and slipped into his car. As he pulled away from the curb heading south on 2nd Avenue, he lifted a CB radio to his lips and started to speak. This man came forward at the hitman trial of Ramil and Galloy and took the words Ramil and Galloy out of Selma's mouth. He claimed he saw the whole thing. He went across the street to help this man, asked him, do you know who shot you? And he said, no. Who was this? You saw the slide with Elaine. A Martian? A professional witness? Who was this man? Years, years, years later, we found him including this one. He was an FBI informant, operated out of the Seattle office of the FBI. How did he get to the murders? Who sent him there? I took his deposition. He said, I was told to go stay in a particular location at a particular time, observe what happened, write a report and send it. Did you write a report about the murders? Yes, he did. Who did you send it to? I'm not trying real hard to remember. We now have a that when Gene traveled to the Philippines, he was under the surveillance of naval intelligence that shared that information with FBI intelligence that shared that information with Marcos and Delaware. And the same with when Gene and Selmy passed the Al W resolution. The Marcos intelligence had a, an operation in this country that included an intelligence slush fund that we proved was used to pay for the murders that went straight into the pockets of the hit. And what was our government? Now, we brought a freedom of information request in doing research for the book. And we were told that, if, you know, that you know, we were not going to find the names of the FBI agents. <coughs> we did a launch party on March 20th at Mary Thought it was a launch of a book. My book it was actually a launch of a new petition campaign. And it's directed to the Federal Bureau of Investigation here in Seattle and National. So here's what we learned. We've got a few documents. They have 1,276 pages. But we now know that there were three investigations going on in 1981 at the time of the murders. The first one was the decade-long investigation of who? The Union of Democratic Filipinos. Out of the FBI office in Seattle, out of the FBI office in the Bay Area. And I just happened to open the file today to, to show you some of the doc. This is one of, of 14 volumes. Here, here's an app, here's a, 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 a teaching that the FBI reports from the flyer the following persons were listed as representatives of the KDP. Cindy Domingo, Dale Bergeson, and Betty Bell. The FBI was watching Gene and Sel. They were watching the KDP and CN. Then the murders happened. They opened up an investigation, 42 agents were assigned. The lead agent, Lee Zavala, told me, it's in the book, they're not going to charge anybody. It's a Hobbs Act violation, they're not going to charge anybody. They're trying to give immunity to the underlings, to, I mean, to the, the Baruso, the man who provided the money for the murders and the gun for the murders. 
They were, they were trying to give him immunity. And then he took an unsolicited job offer from Sealand Corporation. Well, what did we discover? The FBI was using Forsyth as an informant in another investigation. And she, who was involved in that investigation, and knew that Forsyth was an FBI informant, he's a bomb. So what we've done is through this petition, ask the local FBI to send this information that we provided to the Department of Justice Inspector General. And lo and behold, this one. Anybody have a guess? They opened an investigation. We're now about to send them all the materials we've developed showing that here was an FBI informant at the scene of the murders who then testified. And did anybody in the FBI question him? What were you doing there? Did anybody in the FBI say, well, you went forward and perjured yourself at the trial? He testified somebody didn't know who shot him. No. So here you have a confluence of three FBI investigations, and they don't even bother to go to this informant and say, what were you doing? That is a miscarriage of justice. That's an obstruction of justice. That's why we're still in this. I wrote this book as a memorial to my friends. I also wrote it as an invitation to you to become involved, to be part of the justice efforts. If you sign this petition, it's going to go to the FBI. Your name's going to be on a list. You don't think Zinni's name's on a list? You don't think Dave Mike Fox's name's on a list? Sometimes you've got to be on a list to bring about change in this country, folks. I'm a, it's a challenge to you. You're a very important organization. Center for Constitutional Rights, ACLU, Public Justice Foundation, we're all behind you. But it would be great if you could sign this petition and help us achieve final justice to make sure, as we promised in 1981, everyone that was involved in the murder and its cover up be brought to justice. Thank you. Well, that was our presentation. Uh, in the haste of trying to get these guys to talk to you, I forgot to introduce myself. So, uh, so basically, so basically, um, I'm a second or and third generation Filipino American, born and raised here in Seattle. So uh, on my father's side, I'm second generation, and on my mother's side, third generation. I also worked in the Alaska salmon canning industry just like my father, my brothers, and all my uncles did, and experienced directly the discrimination and exploitation that Lumicio and everyone else on this panel talked about. And I worked at Ward's Cove Packing Company. Um, as such, I'm a class member of Antonio versus uh, Ward Cove Packing Company. In fact, uh, Frank Antonio was my roommate in Alaska. Uh, so I knew a lot about what he was going through and what we were going through. I eventually become, became part of the union reform movement that everyone here was talking about that, uh, to carry on the work that came out of the discrimination lawsuits to make sure that the union was going to go back to its protecting Filipino workers. Um, and um, when Selma and Jean were assassinated on June 1st, 1981, I was 20 minutes late for a meeting with them. Had I been on time, I wouldn't be standing in front of you talking with you. Uh, and I was also part of the team that went back into the union hall the next day, literally after the murders, before the blood dried on the floor, to go back and retake the uh, reform union movement uh, from those who had uh, inflicted these assassinations, but also part of the corruption of the union, and eventually um, became part of the union leadership, secretary treasurer, uh, Terry Mast was the president, uh, to lead the union back into the reform effort uh, for many years afterwards. Um, and then also part of the Committee for Justice for Domingo and Verdes. So that's my story, and um, that's our story of the panel. So now we will go into the question and answer period uh, for this panel, and we'll start with John, who wants to ask some questions, right? Yeah. Okay. So first again, I want to thank the panel for, for joining us. Uh, I want to say that uh, Mike Withy's call to action is a uh, is something that is uh, just being uh, delivered to the Infala Advocacy 
committee, so they're going to take a look at it and see what uh, Enfala can do as a group. And I encourage everybody to take a look at uh, the request and to make an individual uh, decision as to whether or not uh, they're willing to put their name on that. I know I certainly am. Um, Thank you. I got this panel together because I, we've been talking about uh, coalition building, how to get behind uh, community groups, and uh, how we can really help uh, Filipino Americans in this country uh, beyond just the, the bar associations and our affiliates. And uh, I think this is a, a very great example, and I hope it inspires everybody. It certainly inspires me. Um, one of the questions that I have um, before opening up to the group here is um, before things got so far along, was there ever a spot, maybe for Demisio or for David, where you think, if, if I had the ability to get a lawyer involved early, <coughs> that, that maybe this could have gone a different way? Um, I never really thought of that because you know, what happened in 1991 um, was not planned. What is this in, while you were working? Yeah, um, but you know, back then, I, I, I did not have that consciousness of, of uh, what was happening. Uh, I was first generation here, and the one thing that my parents, um, my parents, my father never finished higher than the third grade. My mother finished the sixth grade. And so for them, it was critical that uh, their children succeeded. And so um, at that time, I was single focused uh, about <laughs> trying to make it. Sure. Uh, and it's only by happenstance that uh, these things did happen. So, um, um, I think that's what happens to a lot of folks in this country, particularly of, uh, um, of families that are struggling, is that uh, sometimes you have to find some way to look beyond you know, just that narrow vision of, of what you're looking at. And I think this is where education comes in, particularly learning what the history of, of uh, our people are uh, to give you a, a different perspective of what's going on. Uh, otherwise, <coughs> you wind up having a very narrow vision of things. In, in, uh, in my case, the group as a rebel rouser, you know, so I believed in street heat, first of all. So you think about how you put street heat on something before you bring in a lawyer. And so, um, but uh, over the years, and, and particularly through these two particular cases, Ward Cove and Community for Justice, the, the, the role of uh, the, a legal team is very important in helping frame how, how are you gonna respond and get remedy for that particular issue. And um, I do believe now that, that uh, the, the, the legal activity and community organizing has to go hand in hand in order to be effective on any kind of issue that comes in front of the community, but more important, these issues, because they're so uh, steeply rooted in um, you know, a highly access to the legal system to work in your benefit. And then I have a question for Michael Fox. Uh, in your live view article that's in the materials, there uh, is kind of a point by point uh, list of best practices for engaging with community organizations and one of the points that you have is that the lawyer should get to know the organization uh, and its culture before taking on uh, a huge engagement. Uh, what are some ways that uh, <coughs> the uh, bar associations uh, that are represented here can get to know organizations in their community before uh, their members take on these kind of uh, uh, projects? Well, I think the first thing to do is to get out of your office and to go to some meetings. 
and uh, just sit there like a bump on the log. And but make people aware that you're willing to at least have develop a relationship with them. It doesn't mean you have to make a long-term commitment. It may be that the group is only interested in one issue and doesn't really isn't really interested in building a community organization. But most successful community organizations have started with one particular issue, and then they wind up building an organization, people get involved, they get excited, and they want to work on more things. If they have one victory, they'll go on and have others. But uh, I think it really does take, uh, just don't sit in your office and wait for somebody to call you. Just make your part of the community. Go out into the community, meet with folks from the community, and you'll get involved. You have a resource that they need, legal expertise, and a willingness to work. And if you do that, you'll be able to learn pretty quickly about whether this is an organization that's going to go somewhere and do something. Uh, Mike Withy, I have a question for you. Uh, a, lot, a lot of folks like myself uh, don't have a litigation practice. Uh, you know, I, I'm an emergency acquisitions lawyer, a credit finance lawyer, uh, business transactions kind of primarily. But, do you think that if I gave you a call and said, hey Mike, do you have any discrete projects that I can help you on with, without having any kind of litigation background, that, that it would be worthwhile to engage and to try and move the ball forward? And, and what types of projects might those be? Well, absolutely. We, we never thought we'd have to um, reform an insurance policy in, in, in trying to pursue the pursuit of justice. But two days after the murders, we found an insurance binder on the office of the of Local 37, in which Selmy, literally two days before he was shot and killed, took life insurance policies out for everybody in the end. Except when we got the policy back, his name wasn't on it. You know, uh, uh, who was on it? Was uh, Tony Russo, your dad was on it, and uh, some of the other officers. So we had to figure out, well, I've never done a, a, a case to you know, reform an insurance policy. How could somebody not have mentioned himself? Of course he did, we eventually, through John Coughlin, won the case. So yes, I mean, there's lots of things that you need to have help on. We needed to have help. We had, I'd say, probably at least 12 law clerks and lawyers that worked with us in the context of building this case, including a trial. Really, really fine people. Rebecca Kate was at our trial. Uh, I don't know if people in, the, in, in Seattle know um, Howard Goodfriend, he's a great appeal lawyer. Yvonne Ward. Uh, we had some really great people that helped us out, so the answer is yes. I mean, one example is the immigration concerns that we have today. There are many local organizations and communities all over the country working on immigration cases and the to try to push back against this uh, uh, Trump policy. And uh, here in Seattle, is an organization called the Northwest Immigrants' Rights Project. There are a number of private law firms that are volunteering time, getting trained by the Immigration Rights Project people and, and handling uh, the asylum cases and everything else, and helping build those, those immigrant communities. <coughs> Okay, so now we're gonna um, have uh, you ask questions of the panel. So I'm a recovering politician, so I'll work the room. And raise your hand, I'll bring you the microphone, and anyone, any member of the panel can answer. Hi, I'm Jerry Gonzalez Abrams. I'm actually an immigration practitioner here in Seattle. Um, for those of us who wanna get involved, but we worry about the impact on our families, if we have small children, or, or just the fear you might face backlash, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? If we want to get involved, but there's the personal concerns. Are you talking about personal security concerns? Yeah. Um, I think Mike would probably be here, and Cindy would probably be here to answer that. Well, I we always went with the theory that the more visible you are, the more protection you have. Um, so especially right after the murders, if we were silent, if the murderers would have had their way to silence all of the work that was going on, 
to silence the community because we had many people who eventually came forward and gave us various pieces of information. Um, you know, they would have gotten their way and we would have continued to be afraid. I mean, I think obviously it takes um, individual as well as collective courage to do this type of work. Um, obviously, also you can suffer professional repercussions. I myself, fortunately, because of the work that I did, um, was able to advance in my profession. I, I never meant to be in government, but I've served as Chief of Staff to a King County Council member for 24 years as a result of the political work that I did and because he's very progressive himself. But I think, you know, my children, um, they have been, uh, every year we have a memorial uh, and talk about the work that Sammy and Jean did, continue to talk about the work that we did. And my kids have grown up knowing that information and are proud of who they are, of the work that their family has done. And so I think it, I think for children that can be proud of their parents for standing up, for being unafraid, and also to speak up for others that don't have a voice or can't voice their own opposition or their courage. I think for children, it's important to see their parents that way and the friends of their parents. You're all in a dangerous profession, no matter what your legal specialty is. Uh, Jean and Sylvia were murdered in 1981. In June of 1982, my law partner, Tom Neville, was shot and killed in the lobby of the 1111 Third Avenue building in Seattle. Tom was a civil litigator. Uh, he'd been in the Peace Corps, he'd been in Honduras, he'd faced all kinds of retribution there from some of the gangs in, in there. But he was murdered by the husband of a woman that he was representing in a divorce, waited for him in the lobby of the firm and shot him. And no matter what kind of lawyer you are, you're gonna piss some people off, no matter what you do. And could we have foreseen that Tom was gonna to be murdered? No. And, but uh, I don't think that engaging in civil rights work, for example, is any more dangerous than any other field of law. I, I practiced for 19 years, and most of my practice was involved in that area of the law. I never really felt physically threatened. I never felt my family physically threatened. You only got arrested three times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I was acquitted. So. <laughs> No, it was, it was, I was actually convicted of trespassing in a migrant labor camp in uh, Walla Walla County in 1971, but the Supreme Court unanimously reversed it in 1973. So, just to set the record. Real quick, my book talks about my kids. Thank you for raising the question. It's a very dear question to all of us. Kalyat and Lagaya, Selmy and, and Terry's kids are incredibly uh, active in, in union organizing and in other efforts. But I hope I didn't freak people out about this petition because when you read the names on this petition, you're in very good company. And Cindy's absolutely right. When you build a movement, when you build a progressive and justice-oriented movement, that's the, that's the security you have. Any other questions? I'll just, I'll just speak. Uh, I was kind of curious about the Ward's Code case. Were there any efforts to try to resolve the case? I was on the discussion before. Um, was there any thoughts? Were there any kind of proposals to try to resolve the case? Before there? there were proposals to uh, resolve it prior to the case being solved, being filed. And in fact, uh, uh, there's another book written about this uh, uh, by Doug Fryer, who was the lawyer for Wards Cove. It's called. It's written, of course, from the defense perspective. It's called Justice for Wards Cove. And uh, Doug in that book, and Doug's, you know, I got along with him fine as a lawyer for Ward's Cove. He details how we went down to his office the day before the case was, well, within a week before the case was filed, and they made a proposition about uh, implementing essentially an affirmative action program with no damages for the class. And we uh, went back, talked to our clients about it, they rejected it, the case was filed. I don't think there were really any serious settlement discussions after that, but I had left the office by the time the case was tried, so I'm not aware of that. I mean, uh, 
Denisio might know more about that. Uh, I, I just don't recall any of that. In uh, December of 1974, uh, those same companies entered into a uh, conciliation agreement um, over those issues. And so they didn't offer anything to us that they weren't already conceding to EEOC. Um, I was not part of that EEOC agreement because uh, we were going to go ahead and proceed with it. Dick Farinas was the investigator for the EEOC at the time. And uh, we talked recently and he said, um, I'm glad you pursued the case because the one thing that EEOC could not get from those companies were back pay. So, uh, so um, what, what the attorney uh, was talking about was simply not giving uh, complete uh, or making the class whole and that they were entitled to some back wages. Um, so what role, if any, did national organizations play in the defense of the Wars Code, about the prosecution of the Wars Code? Well, there were uh, several organizations that offered financial support. The Campaign for Human Development was one of the, was a, which is an arm of the Catholic Church, uh, was one of the organizations that provided funding to the office to litigate these cases. Uh, there were also some other uh, Protestant uh, organizations that also offered support and some foundations that, uh, that did support civil rights work, such as the Stern Fund, which is now defunct. Um, I can't remember all of them, but we had about, we had seven or eight foundation grants. What about, uh, were there any national lawyers associations Bar Association, anybody around to help, help the, out? Uh, yep. There was, um, and you may know, I, I can't remember the name of this uh, organization, but it was a Japanese-American civil rights uh, organization. I know that Tomio Moraguchi of Seattle was involved with, uh, uh, with that organization, and they, I can't remember if they provided any financial support, but they certainly were endorsing our efforts, and they were kind of an establishment uh, uh, group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Japanese American citizens. That's it. Yeah. Structurally, is there was there any barriers in, like, for example, law regulations, court cases that affected, uh, I guess, the litigation aspect of it? And uh, of those. Are there any that continue to this day? Are you talking about the Wards Cove case or the uh, Committee for Justice case? I'm actually talking about both. Because okay. I'm trying to identify whether it's, for example, any, like, um, I know on the federal end there are uh, ideas to bring out regulations like certain definitions that um, the Institute in the past eight years. Um, but any that, that come, come to mind um, when you litigate, when, well, the, the, when you're involved in litigation case? I mean, the disparate impact theory right. was basically accepted until the Wards Cove decision came down. And again, it was a 5-4 decision. I didn't mention Justice Stevens also wrote a concurring dissenting opinion. And uh, it was a major shock. And uh, Title VII lawyers all over the country were just uh, blown away by this. And the fact that White had ch changed his opinion and going over to this, going over to the dark side. And uh, we basically felt we had a favorable legal structure, but obviously the Supreme Court became more and more conservative, and uh, that's what happened. That's, uh, that, I mean, that's the central holding of the, of the case, is you have to show some kind of intentional discrimination, despite the fact there were facts in this case, as I described. White bunkhouse, Filipino bunkhouse, iron chink, all that stuff. Uh, it was, uh, you know, it's very surprising. Even getting into more in the weeds, uh, like anything in discovery or most of the limiting. No, the discovery in the ca in the cases was was pretty widespread. We had all the records. I mean, we had all the employment records, giving the names, addresses, pay rates. We had a complete company roster, and uh, 
I can't say that there was any procedural obstacles to the litigation of any of these cases. Now, now the, with, I think they had considerably more difficulty in the, in the case against Marcos. There's very, some very unique legal problems there. Well, first of all, I think Cindy uh, talked about the most important one, which is the whole national security doctrine. They moved to dismiss the United, we see the United States saying, you knew about this conspiracy. The conspiracy, by the way, we, we never proved Marcos signed the paper saying kill these two. Like that would be the intent to murder by Marcos. If we had to prove that, we, we wouldn't be there. We, we alleged a conspiracy by the Marcos regime aided by the United States under, under a Bivens claim that, by the United States government, that um, they were operating against the anti-Marcos opposition in the United States with the full knowledge of U.S. intelligence. We barely survived a motion to dismiss in the Philippines, but we did survive a motion to dismiss by the United States. And the grounds upon which they asserted was, this is a matter of national security. Um, the president has sole authority in that field of foreign policy, and this would disrupt foreign policy. But it wasn't just that, it was also that once the U.S. got dismissed, we had a hard time getting discovery against the U.S. We took the deposition of the FBI informant, okay, before we knew it was an FBI. And he said, yeah, my control agent's Ralph Fernandez operating out of Rancho Cucamonga. It's a great note about for a deposition, right? Forsyth testified that after he tested, after he perjured himself in court, that the FBI continued to use him as an informant. So we took Hernandez's deposition. You know what Judge Rossi told us? We get three questions of Mr. Hernandez. Mr. Whitney. U.S. isn't involved. I don't want to hear anything about Forsyth. You can ask him three questions. She's a great judge for us. One, was he an informant? Answer, yes. Two, was he a re considered reliable informant? Yes. And three, was he used as an informant and considered reliable after he purchased himself? And the FBI answered, yes. So that was the obstacle. We didn't have, we had a lot of discovery problems. Um, but I think the doctrines, the legal doctrines of immunity for Marcos, which we got around when Marcos was overthrown, we served him in Hawaii once he was overthrown. Thank you very much. The People's Power Revolution shows you Political verdicts have to precede the legal verdict, folks. Right? Remember Bruce saying that? You know, when a political verdict, Marcos has to be disgraced, and then we can put him up. So I think the, 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 um, the obstacle that we confronted but got around was, once he wasn't the head of state, we could bring him in, and we reinstated him back into the lawsuit after the U.S. government said you have to, uh, you have to grant him well, um, we're going to break so we can. Uh, we're going to break so we can prepare for the next uh, panel that's going to be here, the in-house council panel. But before we do that, I want to let you uh, know that um, the panel, the panelists here, are going to be outside. Um, there's a couple of tables set up where you can check out their books, and if you decide to, you can purchase a book. There's links in the materials to where you can get the books online, and. I just want to say thank you again. This was a amazing piece of history, and um, I, would, I would hope that if there was a National Filipino American Lawyers Association at that time, that you know some of us would have been participating, okay. and. Um, Hopefully, as we look through the materials that were passed out here, that uh, some of the members will take a call to action. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.